Excellent. So we're going to talk about the ransomware epidemic. Um, again, my name is Michael Haig, and I am do the uh, I'm director of advanced threat detection and research at Red Canary. So what we're going to talk about today is behind the scenes of a ransomware operation. So in particular, a how what this looks like from the back end when somebody wants to get into the ransomware business. Um, then we're going to jump right into tools and techniques to detect and respond to attacks. And then I also did a bunch of research on the other side with Red Canary uh, detection data on how to prevent ransomware um, and a bunch of other tool sets that we'll get into as well that should help with preventing it. Oh, here we go. So what is the ROI for ransomware? Why are people, why is this becoming such a hot thing? Um, so if you think about your return on investment when it comes to your money market, you're looking at 0.5%, you know, monthly. Um, you might get a 1% on your CD that you're investing in. Obviously, some are getting a little bit more. Uh, and then you're getting maybe a 7% return on your stock market investment. But with cybercrime, the return on investment for cyber criminals is super, super high. You're looking at almost 1,400% uh, of a return on investment in what you invest into becoming a cyber criminal. That's super high. And this is why ransomware is kicking off so well, is that it's super cheap to get into. It doesn't cost a lot of money. And the return is far more than any other thing that you can invest your money into today. what is the cost of entry to get into ransomware today? It's really not that expensive. And so our friend, our, a colleague of mine, had done the research and he invested into building a ransomware campaign. And so in total, for buying the payload, purchasing the infection vector, um, working on figuring out how to infect machines or doing a drive-by attack, so traffic acquisition, and then that daily traffic hitting his environment, at the end of the day, it only cost him about $5,900 US. Um, really inexpensive to get into. And if you looked into this today, it's even less for very opportunistic um, young cyber criminals who are just getting you know, started with just computers. The barrier of entry is very low today. Uh, it does not take a lot of money to get involved in this. So jumping into the payload itself, a couple of things our colleague wanted to get into or to validate and make sure is that when he was building this, that he could avoid all the standard signature-based detections that are out there today. Um, so you want to invest a little bit more money going into this because you don't want to have Symantec or Trend Micro detecting you. Um, so there's many malware authors out there today that are reselling and selling different ways to bypass all standard AV products. Um, and so what he ended up spending was around 10 Bitcoins. And at that time, it was about $3,000. So 10 Bitcoins today, you're looking at Bitcoin just hit over two grand. So you're looking at almost 20 grand. Uh, it's a lot of money just for this. Um, and then over here on the left-hand side is what one of the ads looks like. So in this case, it was CryptoLocker 3.1. Um, you can purchase the payload for 400 uh, and then to make it bypass most AV products and whatnot, you spend a lot more to get that uh, additional hashing and whatnot built into the product that you purchase. Uh, it doesn't come with support. Um, there are <laughs> most malware authors out there who are at the top of the food chain in creating the stuff. Um, they do offer support to people who need it. Uh, which does come at additional fee, and they're willing to help you through email or even chat today. To make it more exciting is our infection vector. And so in this case, we wanted to, or my colleague really wanted to figure out, you know, what's some of the best ways to infect as many machines possible out there. And so if you think about people who are starting some of those really large campaigns, shipping out a million emails a day, um, you know, it costs a couple thousand dollars. Uh, it could even be the malware authors who are kicking this off because remember that return is very high and they're able to, you know, easily kick these campaigns off and make a lot of money. 
so in this case, if you want to do a quick service, you know, 100 bucks per 1,000 installs, um, or, you know, you want to make sure your quality assurance, you're making sure that it's bypassing AV, uh, it's not, you know, if it's uploaded to virus total, will it bypass all 57 simple scan engines? Um, it's really inexpensive for these things. Um, you can also rent a botnet. So if you're bored and you want to just easy button this, you can just go ahead, buy my botnet. It'll just infect all these machines. You can, again, automate most of it. You're going to pay a little bit more money because, you know, money is money and people work for more money. <laughs> um, so it kicks off your meal. Um, the guy who runs it for you will happily do that. Uh, so it's really, really inexpensive. And you can just kick back, think about your next house, whatever it might be, right? Um, so getting your traffic acquisition here, um, the best way to gain as much traction. Are you going to go big? Are you going to go for the million emails a day, shipping out Drydex campaigns? Um, you know, are you going to do a, you know, a Word document with macros attachment? Are you going to do zip, uh, a zip attachment? What, what's it going to be, right? What's the best bang for your buck? Um, so in this case, uh, obviously the most easiest one is shipping it through phishing. Um, then sometimes scareware, right? You ever been to the one of those, or you ever seen someone go to this, one of those websites where it's like a bunch of pop-ups and they're like, Call Microsoft right now. You need a Windows update. Scareware, you could do that. <clears throat> you could do ad networks. So if you want to bust out some malvertising, uh, you can push your ransomware through malvertisements that might happen to get picked up by Yahoo um, or other like MSN, big top websites. Lots of ads. Um, and then just standard botnets, right? So your ear acquisition could be rotating your ransomware on hundreds of thousands of websites around the globe on compromised websites. Um, so whatever, it's pretty inexpensive to get into. This. Um, and then about the operation on the back end here, you have malware authors who, just like most of our organizations, we have an R&D department in our business, and so do they. They have an R&D department who's constantly looking at new ways to infect our machines and bypass our preventative controls. And on top of that, new ways to bypass detective controls. If you have an IDS or an IPS, what's the best way that's low cost of entry for my malware authors over here to build you know, a way to bypass all these products that we're spending hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars on every year? Um, is it through standard botnets? Is it an easy botnet? Is it just a regular remote access Trojan? If you think about some of the recent leaks that had come out from the shadow brokers, if you're keeping up on that, um, some of these back doors are things that just got patched now but had been open for many, many years. And if malware authors had already known about it, we would have never have known about it for this amount of time. So these guys are working around the clock just like the rest of us trying to make good software they're trying to make good software too they commoditize it they make a lot of money and then they buy nice homes and they put youtube videos of themselves showing off their new cars and their nice sweet homes out there in russia next slide Corey, sir So talk about a little bit about the economies of scale here. If you think about how much money someone makes in these Eastern European countries, and we're just going to kind of pick on Ukraine here at the top, um, they may make only a couple bucks, not a couple bucks, let's say a hundred bucks or so a week in their normal, you know, work position that they have in their country uh, in other countries as well in those Eastern European organized countries, right? Um, and so if you think about how much they're making and the easy barrier of entry to gain, to gain into becoming a cyber criminal, um, even just Googling around, you can identify quick ways to make lots of cash doing ads and whatnot or, or search engine optimization or anything like that makes a lot of money. Um, and so to somebody who's making nothing or very little amount of money, they can now make five to 25 times the normal amount of money illegally. And that's by hiding behind their computer, purchasing a couple things and shipping out lots and lots of emails. Um, and that's what a lot of these guys do. So 
Prime as a service itself here. So again, down at the bottom, we have our non-technical opportunist, and this is gonna be our crime, Crimeware as a service users. Uh, these guys are the ones who are purchasing into these programs. They don't really know a whole lot about what to do. Other than that, they can make a fortune doing this. Um, then you have your resellers and maintainers, almost like your middleman. And a lot of these guys are the ones you may potentially see on forums. And if you gain, if you ever were to gain access to one of the dark web type forums where it's, you know, invite only, takes a lot of vouching and whatnot, you'll find these types of people lurking through there and providing these reselling services to push out their botnets and whatnot. And then at the top here is the actual technical innovators. Um, more recently, some, I think a few of them have been busted um, and they were getting many, many years in prison for the things that they're innovating on and that they're building out there. Uh, software, right? And they, I'm sure if you interviewed one of them, they would just tell you this is my job. I write code and I may ship it to some other guy who puts it all together. And he most likely is the, you know, the actual person, the crimeware boss dude, who's it's really interesting, but this is as a service. All right. So from here, what is the ROI? So everything our colleague had done um, generated, you know, easily could generate 20,000 visitors based off of this initial investment, right? $5,900, 10% infection rate. We obviously see a lot more infection rate today from more recent variants of ransomware. And, you know, let's just say the payout rate is 0.5%, people actually paying the ransom. Uh, you're only asking for $300 on this campaign. And so you're looking average 30 days, about $3,000 a day or $90,000 a month, um, 90 grand a month. And if you keep inside, so if you keep reinvesting your money uh, to purchase new campaigns or new infection vectors, you can continue to make even more and more. Um, and a lot of these people do, right? So a lot of them are focused on the biggest bang, building really large botnets. They're building herds of botnets. Um, some more recent ones can have 50, 60,000 bots in there, and then they resell that botnet. You know, they kind of get out of the game. They resell the botnet off to somebody else who will just continue to push rap malware out there, uh, advertisements to those endpoints and things like that. Um, so we see a lot of that happening out there too. Cool. So hop into defense techniques. Um, Couple things we're gonna run through here is understanding the attacker's mindset. Um, I will show you a very high level amount of resources that are available today for preventing ransomware. And then we're gonna talk about prevention appetite. And then I will give you guys some of my top five favorite prevention techniques that you can employ today to help out there today. Excellent. So we're up against two types of attackers, right? Um, we have our enlightened threat actors and then we have our naive actors. And so our enlightened are ones who are actually aware of your environment and how to bypass the products that you have employed today. So your enlightened actor is going to know you most likely have antivirus deployed. You probably have some sort of firewall with ACLs inbound blocked, uh, blocking inbound ports, but you're also egressing, you're allowing outbound 80 and 443. Um, you may have an IPS or maybe even an IDS. You might be monitoring your traffic. So he understands your environment pretty well. Um, and those are just standard guesses, right? So it could be anybody who just Googles around how to secure a network. Here's basic defenses. I now know a little bit more about most organizations. And then you have your naive actors. Uh, these are the people who are buying those million email addresses and they're shipping out their campaign that they bought for $5,900, and they're just hoping that they get 5% of a million people to click on this link so that they could win, you know, you know, so that they can make a bunch of money, right? Very naive, very opportunistic at that point. So from there, 
Um, a group that I've been working with, a guy by the name of Florian Roth, you can find him on Twitter as well. He generated a spreadsheet with a bunch of guys out there who are dealing with ransomware, just like the rest of us, all of us. Um, they generated this really good spreadsheet. And within the spreadsheet, there's 16 different things, 16 different resources that you can employ today. And so the link here today is right here. It's this shortened Google URL um, within it. It talks about your standard things, a backup and restore process. Um, if, if you're backing up your, your files today, I highly recommend doing offline backups. So if you're doing tapes or disk or whatever it might be, store your disk and whatnot offline. Um, basic things like blocking macros, uh, disabling Windows scripting hosts, all the way down to uh, Windows file screening, which we'll talk about here in a minute and some of the other additional research I did as well uh, in relation to how to block ransomware. But first, let's talk about your prevention appetite. So prevention appetite in particular is how much prevention can your organization handle? And I look at this from the perspective of, I worked at a really large organization, lots and lots of people, varying degrees of what they can accept as far as prevention goes. And so in this case, if you're looking to deploy an application whitelisting solution or any other new type of AV that could prevent more things, um, you have to understand the appetite. You have developers, your research and development teams who can only handle so much prevention, right? Because they have to be able to code, build software, push it out. And if your prevention over there is bugging them or stopping them from doing their job, you potentially just stopped the business from moving forward. Uh, accounting, finance, and HR, they open Word docs all day. And some of them are going to have macros. Um, so those macros, if you disable macros, or if you have a prevention tool out there that's you know, preventing them from doing their job and opening up all these documents, you prevented them. Us in IT and security, we don't like prevention products on our endpoints. A lot of the times, a lot of us disable AV because it's in our way. <laughs> so how much can we accept? Um, and then our executive leadership teams, a lot of them don't want to deal with their password prompt coming up after five minutes when their machine went idle and they're in front of a crowd of 20,000 and they're trying to present something, right? Um, how much can they accept? So I always recommend understanding what your organization can handle when it comes to the amount of prevention you're looking to deploy upon people. Um, talk to your R&D teams, talk to your accounting, IT, and CEO or executive leadership team. Understand what they're willing to accept. And you're going to have to base and build out your prevention controls based on those recommendations of what they can and can't handle. Talk about two infection vectors. Um, pretty standard today. You got your web. Uh, so in this case, your drive-by malware advertisements or as campaigns are coming into our organizations, please click this link, download the evil thing. Go from there and then you have your email infection vector email based born threats are probably the most common at this point um, all the bad things are coming in that way and then down there in the fall far corner you see that little usb drive sneak in there you still have sneaker net happening everywhere around the globe everybody travels with a usb drive plugs it in or gets them at conferences and plugs them in um, recommend looking at some sort of proxy gateway on the website uh, whether you're going to whitelist everything allow prevent uh, blacklist or whitelist on the proxy side. Um, probably your most important place to focus at coming towards email based born threats is on the mail gateway side. If you have the ability to configure it and tune it to the point of where you're preventing specific file types coming inbound. So if you think about zip plus whatever's in that attachment, JS, JSE, EXEs, things like that, you can prevent those from coming in or quarantine them if you're using a product that allows to quarantine all of that. Um, so from that point, uh, let's go ahead and click next here and talk about macros. So macros, obviously, um, as you're looking around and then trying to understand your prevention appetite, um, how much of the organization actually needs macros? Do developers need macros or is it just finance who has that one spreadsheet that they open once a year where macros have to be enabled? Um, how much of this attack service can you reduce by disabling macros globally across your organization? Simple things to figure out, right? Uh, Office 2016 will have the ability to, you know, disable macros by default now. Uh, today, with Office 2013 and whatnot, we have to deploy an ADMX file uh, through Google policy. Uh, 
um, which is you know on our blog post, part of the spreadsheet as well. Um, but all of this is pretty simple to do. You can disable macros globally. Um, this helps prevent a pretty good amount of things. But what happens when that one person says enable macros because he really did think it was that resume he was looking for? Let's check out the next thing that we did here. So of all the research, of all the detections that Red Canary goes through monthly in the last couple of years, um, what I did is I gathered all the standard places that malware executes out of. And so in this particular case, the most common places over here on the right-hand side under Microsoft App Locker in the gray box, there's five locations there, and most all of them are going to be in the user profile. So everything malicious, once it's opened out of Outlook or in a Word document, it executes out of the user's profile. So what can we do to prevent things out of the user profile that are malicious? Uh, so Microsoft has this product, or comes with Windows, um, 2008 and up today, called Microsoft App Locker. Um, I took all of the Red Canary detections, about 30,000 of them or so, and I calculated where most common paths are right there. And then I took the most common file, malicious file extensions that are being used and found within these paths and executing from these paths. Um, so if you see there, you'll see JSE, JS, things that should not be executing out of the user's profile. Um, the only thing that I would not recommend preventing out of a user's profile is EXE. Executable files are very common out of the user profile, and you'll end up preventing WebEx, any other, you know, things that people are opening. Uh, very common applications happen to be executing out of there. However, most associates are not executing JavaScript files on their machine day in and day out. Um, and so what I created was a full-on Microsoft App Locker policy. I exported it. All the extensions you see on the screen here, I put into the app locker policy, prevents it out of the user profile, prevents them out of the program data directory as well. You can expand on this. It's very easy to create new app locker policies. So you can say, prevent these same file extensions out of the doc, you know, the my documents directory, or even just the root directory, C drive, whatever it might be. Very easy to continue to add on to that. Let's flip to the next screen and talk about file servers. Um, so there's another service that Microsoft came out with, I think it was back in 2008 R2. It's called Microsoft Windows File Screening. File screening in particular is really interesting to me because it actually allows you some pretty granular controls on what can and cannot be put on your file servers. So if you think about ransomware and once it finds like that uh, network share that someone has attached to their machine, that network share in particular begins to get encrypted. Well, with Windows file screening, you can actually say, prevent these file extensions from writing on my file server. Um, so what I have provided on our Red Canary blog, there's a link here that actually leads you to a PowerShell script that will download all the most common uh, malware ransomware uh, file extensions that rewrite, and it will prevent those writes from happening on your file servers. It's really, really easy and clean to employ. Um, and then additionally, um, the most common tips here on a file server is just removing everyone permissions. Um, we had a question once about what if we disable, what if we do LNK files on the desktop versus doing attach? It, it just all depends on the type of ransomware you're dealing with. Um, it, it versus doing drive network shares uh, and LNK files, it just depends on the type of ransomware you're dealing with. And if they're looking for link files on desktops or whatnot, they might just go and encrypt the share anyway. Uh, we've also ran across ransomware that actually scans the network. Uh, before WannaCry came around, we had ransomware that was scanning looking for open shares. Once it found that open share, it instantly started encrypting network file shares quick and easy. Um, and then obviously the most common thing is backing up and storing those backups offline. We ran into, ran, we ran into targeted ransomware now where the actors will get in the environment and target specific servers in the organization and specifically go straight for your backup server. Um, and then obviously one of the most important things you can do is educate associates in the business today. Um, whether it's putting up printed little pamphlets and or sending emails out about phishing awareness, this is one of the most important things you can do and just as you educating associates on what to do when they do receive an email that looks fishy. Uh, but getting back, how do they know the email's fishy? Uh, so trying to help them understand that 
Um, one thing I always was told was that when you're getting into fishing education or uh, security awareness type things for an organization is try to make it personal. If you make it personal, they begin to take it home. And once they take it home, they change their behaviors at home, knowing that they now need a password vault. They're going to use the password vault to protect all their passwords uh, and rotate passwords. And then they begin to think about things when they receive that, you know, that email from their cousin who, you know, all of a sudden is spamming all their friends through their mailbox, right? So they start to think about these things and they take it back to the business and they start to help out the business by not clicking on every email they receive. So talk about your next layer of defense, right? So a couple things like we talked about as far as prevention appetite, um, understanding your environment, what can and cannot execute using Microsoft App Locker, file screening. Some of the biggest things I help organizations work to understand is their backup strategy. It's still a big thing out there today. Um, removing your local admin rights. Uh, performing vulnerability and patch management. That's still a really important key factor. If you think about what happened with WannaCry and it's scanning the internet, infecting organizations over SMB. We're still using SMB v1 today, uh, whether it's for legacy systems or not, it's still out there. There's still a million machines with SMB enabled. That's not counting machines on our internal networks. Uh, so getting your next layer. So what we built here today with just those five things is you have your gateway. You're gonna now begin to review your gateway policies and what's allowed inbound. You're now going to disable macros. You'll deploy your app locker policy. And then your furthest backstop here is going to be that Windows file screening technological barrier, preventing those mass rights. And then the most important key thing here is educating our associates, making sure they understand what's going on in their business, working to make additional awareness of what to and what to not click out there. One of the questions that um, I think that most people want to know is, you know, when it comes to ransomware, you know, what, what are the steps do, do I, what steps do I need to take in terms of my endpoint to actually have protection? Um, yes, we may have our, you know, web browsing gateway, we may have our email security gateway, but what about the endpoint? Um, how does Red Canary help to um, assist in terms of prevention of um, ransomware at the endpoint? Yeah, great question. And so everything we do at Red Canary is based on detection and response. And, and so we we have all the common things that ransomware does, plus all other malware does too, as far as detecting these things. And so once ransomware infects a machine, we do get that event, we do respond to it. Um, but I think the most key thing here is that you're not alone after that point. A Red Canary technical account manager will give you a phone call and they will work with you to work on understanding how widespread it was, if there was any other machines infected. Uh, we will also help you with understanding how to revert things back and, and get your environment back to a good shape. You're not alone. And a lot of organizations are very much alone when they get infected with ransomware. Um, but as far as prevention goes, that's where I've done all the research. We've worked on all these things to help working on <laughs> building you know, app lock policies, building of those different layers to feel you get fine. And if it's poker file screening, your standard your pad, all that stuff will help at that degree. Hope that answers your question. Um, that, that was that was definitely a very good answer. Uh, when when is it that um, you know virus scans, um, antivirus software uh, IDS, IPS, all those things. I mean, how does it play into protecting you against um, ransomware? Or does it? Because a lot of our customers have, you know, Cisco AC firewalls, they have Dell Sonic firewalls, they have um, proxy servers, they have, you know, email gateways and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, you know, either via sneaker, sneaker net or via other means, they still seem to catch ransomware. Uh, you know, what is, the, what is that panacea for ransomware? Yep, and that's, the, that's just how easy it is for ransomware to become such a big thing. 
Um, and so we buy all these products. I bought all these products as well in my previous life. I, you know, always tried to. Uh, but at the end of the day, you start to realize just how much the products that you have, like the things built into Microsoft Windows and into Active Directory, directory services and all those things, right? All those things are there to help prevent a lot of these types of things. Most of the time, most organizations are not embedding the amount of time to understand these new features, even the new features that are coming out with 10, like device guard and credential guard and all these things. Um, these new features are here to help us prevent a lot of these types of attacks, even beyond ransomware. Uh, if you think about lateral movement and credential theft, past the hash, right? All these great features are here to help us. But all of that just came with Windows. We didn't have to buy a bunch of products to figure that out. Um, and that's where like endpoint detection comes into play. Um, or, well, two things, really good IT hygiene, understanding your environment, locking things down appropriately, doing standard system hardening, um, making sure your perimeter is locked down, right? Whether it's email perimeter or just your standard firewall perimeter. The thing that we used to always question at my last organization, we had over uh, just kind of like an idea how big the company was. We had 2000 or so egress points all across the globe. We had 2,000 ways, barriers of entry across my entire organization, all into any of my companies. Tons of landscape, right? So how do you protect that? And one of the ways that we would go about with some of our companies was to do egress filtering. Not every one of our organization has to have outbound 445 or 137 or anything like that. Most of our organizations just used 80 and 443 to just access web-based services. And then what we would do once we locked down their egress is we would monitor for any other ports that were being blocked going outbound. And that's like a simple alert. Tell me when someone's hitting 8080 going to the internet, that's most likely suspect at that point. But a lot of those things, it's just building those defenses. And we talk a lot about defense in depth here at Red Canary too. Um, but getting your defense in depth in place, building out a solid security strategy, um, it's very much a cyclical process. Uh, the strategies that I help build out for our customers today it's very cycle. Uh, I try to work with them to build out that vulnerability patch management program, logging and, and alerting within that environment, um, whatever EDR, do some additional prevention, understanding how we're going to educate, enforce our policies, things like that, right? There's a whole amount of things that we have to do to help secure our organizations. There's not just that one nice silver bullet that could truly help us. the audience. Um, okay, I have one more. Uh, when it comes to this kind of security, this sounds like only the Department of Defense, the CIA, FBI, and Fortune 500 companies can afford to do any of this because um, this is hard. This is difficult. Uh, how does Red Canary um, help to um, alleviate the stress for the small, medium, um, size business because you know for for businesses of you know that has a small IT department that may have you know a single security officer you know this is just too much information too much to handle um, how how can a service um, from like from a Red Canary help to to assist in in something like this because this is almost impossible okay excellent um, so about like kind of the two things of what Rick Canary is, what Rick Canary does. Um, from the perspective of what, of what we are is as an organization, we're here, whether it's small, medium, or large, we're here to help make your security better. Um, and so from that perspective, Red Canary hires subject matter experts, whether it's people who know endpoint data very well, who know how to lead stocks very well, uh, whatever it might be, right? The technical account management team was built for this purpose to help any size organization. Like mentioned at the beginning, I'm from a Fortune 150. I helped build a security program and took it to something. Um, we have other hands on the team who have led and built out really large security organizations as well. Uh, and who you're actually about to hear from in a minute, Keith Kamen, he helped build a really large security team. Um, and it's a lot bigger than the one I built. <laughs> um, and then what Red Canary does, we bring Fortune 100 security 
to small medium businesses. Um, our, our focus and our goal is to help secure organizations. And it's, we may bring a single product to you, which is going to be carbon black response, which is what we do our detection with, right? We bring that to you, but we also bring the experts behind it. Um, everybody on the team knows the product very well. We're here to help you with that. But from the other degree, like you just heard me talk about, building out a security program, building a security strategy, we're also here to help you with that too. Um, we're here from end to end, ready by your side when there's a threat actor in your organization, whether it's ransomware, malware, we're here to help you detect it, respond to it, and work with you to prevent it next time. That's what we're here to do. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we definitely appreciate that presentation on ransomware. Um, it's a... <coughs> Sorry. It's but definitely an education. I, I think um, even for me, um, there are some, some statistics that you had up there that um, were quite surprising, even though I've extensively read about it. And I think for the audience, um, it is definitely appreciated in terms of um, what is ransomware and how to prevent or to protect your organization. Some more about it. Using just ordinary Windows tools using ordinary Windows um, applications on modules that are available today. And um, as, as uh, Mike said, uh, we will actually share some of that with the, with the audience to make sure that you're putting those in place. And, that's not, and that is why we're here. Okay.